Uh, you thought you got that over with. But uh, i got to make a confession. Uh, I'm, It's been one of those mornings. I, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, we were eating the Lord's Supper, and of course we have the, the cup there for convenience sake, and I had no problem with the wafer. But it came to the grape juice. Apparently, I don't have the intellect to pull that one off. It should come with instructions. And uh, Sherry said, Ray, let me help you. And I'm thinking, help me? You've already spilled it all over yourself. <laughs> Blind leading the blind. Uh, so that was my first confession. My second confession is uh, a couple of years ago when I was preaching in Winchester, Tennessee, uh, uh, I had a two-part sermon. Many years ago, uh, I learned that if you have a lot of material, don't try to cram it all in. Just make it a two-parter, right? So that's what I plan to do today. The bad thing is we're not coming back tonight. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, no, he's going to cram it all in one sermon. And we'll be here an hour and a half. No, he won't. Just about 50 minutes. No, so what I'm going to do, so if I look lost up here, which I typically do, I'm trying to weed out some things. I'm going to try to get it all in one sermon. So if I'm doing this or something like that, that's what's going on. As a matter of fact, I want to insert this. When I was preaching in Winchester, like I said, I got up one Sunday morning and I said, uh, I'm going to, this sermon that I'm preaching this morning, I decide uh, to do a two part sermon. I don't recall what the topic was, but it's pretty. I kid you not. After the service, she said, Ray. And to say, well, Eric needs to come on Sunday night so he could hear part two. So she wanted me to accommodate his for sake of the simply. Uh, but at any rate, so I'm going to try to weed out some things uh, that I plan to use in the second sermon so I can uh, uh, cover all that. And the reason I want to cover it all, because if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be noticing verses 11 through 32. Now you know why I did a two-parter, right? The prodigal son. The prodigal son. That's one of the most renowned favorite passages in Scripture, I believe, because it is the hub. It is the center, the core of the good news of the gospel. As a matter of fact, many years ago, Mark Twain said that Jesus was the greatest storyteller and his best work was the prodigal son. It was a story that had family dynamics. It was a story of bad choices. It was a story of suspense, of restoration or reconciliation. And in the end, ultimately, it was a happy ending. So he said it was one of the greatest stories ever told. A lot of times, I think we look at this story in this parable, if you will, and never truly understand the meaning of it and why Jesus uh, shared it on this occasion. In order to understand the why of it all, you go back to verse 1, verses 1, 2, 3. And it says there that on this occasion that the, uh, that the publicans and the sinners came near to hear him. And then in verse 2 it says, But the Pharisees and the scribes grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Can you imagine the audacity of eating with sinners and associating with sinners? No one in the church would ever say that, would they? No one in the church would ever, ever grumble and complain that we associate with sinners. I don't know why we don't. 
those sinners and us. Finish this for me. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's right. Jesus, why did you come to this earth? To stay away from the sinners? To only associate with those in the church? No. To seek and to save the lost. And I want to tell you, we're the body of Christ. We're his body, his spiritual body upon this earth. So whatever Jesus did, that's what we should be doing. We should be seeking and saving the lost. Everything that we do, every program, every activity should be the ultimate goal is to seeking and saving the lost. But on this occasion, getting back to the story, it's there in verse 2 that, or verse 1, you have the sinners and the publicans. They wanted to hear Jesus. They were coming to Jesus. And the Pharisees, the religious elite, they should have been excited about that. But instead they grumbled. They complained because Jesus was actually receiving them and eating with them. I can imagine Jesus standing there, maybe scratching his head, thinking, what am I going to say? How am I going to address this situation? A group of people that have rejected me, and, and, and then you have another self-righteous group. So how am I going to speak to the relationship between one another and the relationship with God? And in verse 3 says, and he told this story of this parable. And you drop down to verse 11. And he said unto them, There was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he gave unto, this, unto him his living. And not many days afterward, he took this journey to a far country. And there he squandered or wasted all of his, his inheritance. And there came, became a famine upon the land, and he became hungry, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into its fields to feed, feed swine. And he desired to eat the crumbs or the pods that the pigs were eating, but no man gave unto him. And then about verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, how, how many, how much of my father's hard servants have bread enough and spare, and yet I perish with hunger? And then he formulated a plan. He says, I will go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me a hard servant. And he arose, and he went to his father, And he said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. But the father stops him. He wouldn't allow him to finish his, his story, if you will, or his, his statement of forgiveness or sin. But the father says to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That would be a great story if it ended there, wouldn't it? But it didn't. And this is a sermon for tonight. <laughs> now the elder son was in the field. And as he was coming back to his home, he heard music and dancing. And he asked one of his servants what these things meant. And he said unto him, Your brother has come home, he's alive, he's safe and sound. And you would think he would be excited about that, but he wasn't. The Bible says, and he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And the older son says, Lo, over all these many years I have served you, and yet you never gave me a goat that I make, might make merry with my friends and celebrate but as soon as your son has come who has wasted your inheritance with harlots or prostitutes, you have killed for him the fatted calf and the father. And of course, in this story, I meant to say this, in this story, the younger son represents the tax collectors and sinners, and the older son represents the Pharisees and the religious elite. And of course, the father is God. 
And the father says to the older son that was complaining, really to his father, he said, son, lo, these many years you have served me. And you are ever with me, and all of these things are yours. But it was right that we celebrate. For this, your brother has come. He was lost and is found. He was dead, but he's alive. And they begin to celebrate. If you're taking notes this morning, there are three, but that's, that's only from the Sunday morning lesson. Uh, if you could just see the look on your faces right now. But I want to talk about three things as we cover the younger son, then I'm going to make a general comment on the older son. That's where I'm going to do my editing part. If you're taking notes, here they are in reference to the younger son. Separation, examination, and restoration. Again, separation, examination, and restoration. Just like this young man. I don't know all the reasons he came and, and asked his father for his inheritance. I just don't know. Maybe he was tired of living in, the, in this town. Maybe he was tired of his older brother. There's so many reasons, I suppose. But he goes to his father and he says, Give me what belongs to me. And as soon as he got it, like a lot of young people, he went as far as he could go. I remember when I was young, a teenager, Jamie, I don't know how many times I said, man, once I'm old enough, I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to go as far as I can go from this small town. I live in Raymer, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, that's about as far as it can go, right? Uh, but maybe the son felt that way. But the Bible says, nonetheless, that he got his stuff that he demanded and he went to a far country. He went as far as he could go from the father. And he wasted everything. Found himself eating in a pig pen. Eating what the pigs ate. Folks, that's about as low as it can go. That is about as far from the father that you can go. And I think that's the story of a person that finds themselves in such a situation that they have removed themselves so far from God. And we live in a world where, for various reasons, maybe it's bad relationships, maybe it's being ashamed of something, a past that they're not proud of. You fill in the blank. And we just want to get away. And we want to go as far as we can from God. We don't want to worship anymore. We don't pray anymore. We don't want to associate with Christians anymore. So we go as far as we can. We as the church, there are a lot of things that we can do. There are a lot of things that we can be involved with. But you know what our mission is? It's to run to the runaways. Run to those who are hurting. Running to those who have, are living in that far country that have separated themselves from God for various reasons. Not to judge them, not to talk about them, but to love them. And because you do love them, you're going to run to the runaways. You want to bring them back home. You want to ask them how you can help them. There are a lot of hurting people out there. I mean, there's people that are hurting so bad that the suicide rate is so high. We live in a world where people feel hopeless. We need to give them Jesus Christ. We need to give them hope, the greatest hope of all, a hope that transcends this life, to tell them there's something so much better. I'm reminded of the story in Acts chapter 16, you remember it's here that Paul and Silas is out preaching the word of God and, and uh, they were ultimately thrown into prison. And you remember at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing praises to God and worship of him and praying. And that's, folks, that's joy. And that's what we should be about. And then it says in the latter part of verse 25, and the prisoners heard them. I want to tell you, 
people listen to us. People see how we treat each other, how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're listening to that. They're seeing that, especially in small towns. Everybody knows what's going on. But in verse 28, when the guard realized after the, the earthquake shook the, the jail and the stocks fell off their feet and the door was open and the jailer looked around and he realized what happened. The Bible says in verse 28 that he took a sword and he was about to do what? He was about to take his life, to take his very life because he knew that if they were placed in his charge and they escaped, he knew what lie ahead, so it would be easier for him just to take his own life. And I love what Paul says and Silas, when they <clears throat> saw what was going on, a man was about to take his life, he says, do yourself no harm because we are here. We're still here. Everything's okay. And I want to tell you, we live in a world again that so many people have traveled into a far country that has no hope, or at least they feel like there's no hope. Bad situations. And it's time that we as the church stop fighting with one another and being focused on the trivial things. We need to be a church that shouts clearly to the world from the mountaintops, do yourself no harm. We are here Jesus is here, and we want to help. That's what we're about. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to be a servant. And we need to be servants. We need to be a servant church. But we're so busy doing things that really don't matter, playing games at the foot of the cross. Boy, I tell you what, Jeff, I don't know about this sermon. <laughs> I'm going to have to start editing real fast. Uh, so, point number one, the separation. So many people are separating themselves from God because we do live in a world that it's a, it's a mess sometimes, and that's why I can't do it on my own, and you can't either. That's one reason the church exists, is so we can encourage each other and lift up one another and to share Jesus with others. So there was a separation but then there was an examination. So here it is, this young man is in the pits with pigs, with hogs, with swine. And it was a mess and, and the mud and the muck and he's so hungry and destitute that it would bring him a great joy just to eat the pods that the pigs were eating. And I love verse 17, perhaps the pivotal verse in this chapter. And when he came to himself... Sometimes that light bulb comes on, doesn't it? We find ourselves in situations and relationships or whatever it may be, a relationship with the Lord and others, and we're miserable. And then one day the light bulb comes on and we think, I need to change. I need to get right. I need to trust God more. I need to love more. But what made this boy change his mind? And we know he changed his mind because the first thing he thought of, he says, you know what? The servants back in my father's house, my father's house have bread enough in the spare, and here I am. I'm the father's son, and I'm starving to death. And he gets up and he goes home. But here's two things. <laughs> two things. What made this young man come to his senses and to realize just how far away from his father it was? It was the thought of his father's house. It was the thought of a loving father. And he knew that his father loved him. He knew that he could go back. And he formulated a plan. He says, all right, I'm going to go home. And I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hard servants. And I bet all the way home he rehearsed that. And don't you know it's difficult? Maybe he thought that his brother and friends, and they're going to give you that speech, I told you so. I knew it. You always thought that you were better than everybody else, that you were special, you were so godly and spiritual. I knew in your heart of hearts 
that you'd do something like this. And boy, you've really messed up, you sinner. But what made that young boy go home? A loving father and a good home. I love what Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 at verse 4. Where he says, don't you know that it's the kindness and the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. We need to reverence God. We need to humble ourselves before an omnipotent holy God. But we need to know for sure that we can be confident to come before God. That we have that relationship with God as a child with the Father. So Paul says, you know what will cause someone who has traveled into a far country and separated themselves from God? You know what will cause them to get up, the light comes on, and go back home? It's not fear. But it's the acknowledgement and understanding and full assurance that I have a God, I have a Father that loves me. And he'll take me back. And he will. I can never... You can never go too far that God will not take you back. You just can't. Because God's forgiveness is as far as the east. It's from the west. And when he forgives, he forgives totally. The slate is clean. It's as if it's never happened. And that's what justification means. I heard this somewhere, I don't know where. But somebody said the, def, the way to remember what it means to be justified is to know that once God has forgiven me, it's just if I'd never sinned. Now, there are people who will not forgive us, right? There were people who will hold on to that. God doesn't. God doesn't. And so the young boy, he came to himself he examined himself, and he didn't want to be there anymore. So he goes home, and, and again, I'm sure he rehearsed that speech over and over again. Father, I've sinned, <clears throat> I've sinned before heaven against you, and I'm no more worthy because your son make me as one of your hard servants. Over, over. And I mean, there's maybe some doubt there in people. But he went. And then one day, the father is standing outside, and he looks, every morning, he looks down that path that leads from the woods and around it comes to his house. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for that boy. He's looking for that son and he doesn't know if he's dead or alive. And every day he faithfully gets up and he looks down hoping that he comes home. And then one morning, like he did every day, he gets up and he looks down and he sees an image and he keeps looking and he says that, you know, he walks like my son. That is my son. And again, the son had it all prepared, his speech. And it says that when the father saw his son, he didn't say, well, if you're going to come home, then you're going to have to walk all the way up here. You're going to have to get on your knees and beg to come home. And you're going to have to earn it. And you're going to have to pay your dues. But the father didn't do that. The father made a beeline. The father says he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he ran to him, he fell on his neck, he kissed him, and he gets up and he orders his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, kill the fatted calf, and we're going to celebrate, we're going to have this huge party. Because I thought my son was dead, but he's not. He's alive and well. That's God. That's God. No matter what I've done or you have done in this life, God will forgive us. 
God will take us home. And you know what that meant when he put the robe on him and the ring on his hand and shoes on his It meant complete restoration. As if you never left. As if you've always been there. Even though the son would, would have been happy just to be a servant. But he was a son. And God's the father. He completely restored him. And they began to celebrate. I'm almost finished. There's another son. And he was out in the field working. And I'm sure this son had a lot of good traits. He was a hard worker. He was devoted to his father. He didn't love his brother. He did a lot of good things, right things. A, B, C, one, two, three, but he didn't love his brother. And I believe this story was really emphasized more on him than the prodigal son. Because again, the older son represents that second group that Jesus was addressing. Those arrogant, self-righteous Pharisees and scribes. And he's in essence saying this is how you're treating those tax collectors and sinners. And you remember as he was coming home from the field, he heard music and he heard dancing. And he was confused. He turns to his servant and says, what do these things mean? What's going on? And I think this servant was excited. I think he was so happy and he thought his master was going to be excited and happy. He said, oh, haven't you heard? Your brother, you know, the one that left a long time ago, we didn't know if he was safe and sound, didn't know if he was dead or alive. He's home. And he's safe and he's sound. And you would think the natural response would be, that's wonderful. Let's go in and celebrate with him. But he didn't. His true colors came out. And the Bible says, and he was what? He was angry. And he pouted and would not go in. But here's the father again. He went to him. He ran to the runaway that never left home. You see, sometimes we can run away spiritually, remove ourselves from God, and still be physically somewhere. I can attend all the worship services. I can come to everything that happens in this church or my church. But if I don't love my brother and sister, and I don't love my God, I'm far away. I'm just as far in that faraway country as that younger son was. And the father comes out. And the son says he's so selfish. He says, Father, all these years I have served you tirelessly. And you never gave me a kid that I make, might make merry with my friends. And here it is. But as soon as this, my brother comes home. That's not what he says. As soon as this, your son. Wouldn't even call him his brother. This is your son. He's not my brother. But as soon as he comes home, you kill for him the fatted calf and you live it up. And the father says, son. He basically says, I love you. And you've always been here. Everything that I have is yours. But it was right. It was right that we celebrate. Because your brother was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and he found it was right that we celebrate because he's home. Do you see the play on words there? The son says, but as soon as this your son comes. But the father came back and says, but this your brother has come home. I might be physically in a church building, but my spiritual person can be in a far country. 
Because if I don't love my brothers and sisters in Christ the way that I should, I'm far, far away. I'm far, far away. John says in 1 John chapter 4 to about verse 20, he says, if we say that I love God, who I have not seen, and hate my brother, who I do see, I am a what? You're lying. It can't happen. I can't say, oh God, I love you. I worship you. You're so awesome. You're so great. But then I despise my brother and sister. I don't want anything to do with my brother and sister in Christ. John says through the Spirit, you are a liar. And I want to tell you, I do not need a commentary on 1 John to figure that one out. And I'm not very bright, but that is explicitly stated. That is, to love God is to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I don't love my brothers and sisters in Christ... I don't love God. Just like this older son. He did a lot of good things, but he didn't get it. How in the world could his brother be so far away and he didn't know anything about him and he comes home and he's angry and he's angry and upset and says those things to his father. In conclusion, greatest words in a sermon. Those two words are incredible. Everybody perks up. But in conclusion, question. This is going to challenge you. Challenges me and where we worship. When somebody in the community, in a conversation or whatever the scenario may be, but when people in the community hear of the Bolivar Church of Christ, what's the first thing they think of? Is it some doctrinal issue? Or is it the fact that you love each other? I want to tell you, folks, that is the badge of identity, is loving each other. And I'm going to give you one source, and it's a pretty good one. Jesus Christ, pretty good source. After he washed his apostles' feet in John chapter 13, Jesus, after he served them, he said, now you serve each other. And he gives them a new commandment in verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this... By loving each other? By this shall all people know that you're my disciples. And here's the condition. If, if you teach the right things. Oh, no. My memory's not like it used to be. I just can't remember anything. No. By this shall all people know that you're my disciples if you attend every worship service. No. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. How do you misunderstand that? Do I want to be a disciple of Christ? Do I want people in the community to know that we're the Lord's church, that, that we are the body of Christ, that we are believers, that we are the redeemed? The called out, the ecclesia. Well, how do, I, how do they know that? Love each other. So when somebody hears Bolivar Church of Christ, ah, yeah. That's those people that love each other. They love each other. And I want to be a part of that. This morning... I pray that all of us will understand without a doubt, with full assurance, that no matter how far from God we may fall, 
No matter how far someone that we know are removed from God, it's never too far that can't come back. Because God loves us with a love that's indescribable. The greatest thing in the world is to be a Christian. To know that no matter what happens in this life, I have hope because of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, Jeff read, or maybe you read it, Will. Somebody read it. I don't, can't remember. Ephesians chapter 2, about verse 8 or 9 there, Paul is speaking to Gentile converts. He said, remember, there was a time when you were separated from Christ. And then he says something so sobering. He says, you were alienated from God. You were without any hope and without God. That's, that's a bad place to be. But, here's the good news. But now in Christ Jesus, in the shedding of his blood, you're saved. You're redeemed. If there's anybody here this morning that needs to come back to the Lord, we're here to help. We're not here to judge. We're here to help, to pray for you. Maybe there's someone here that's never put on Christ, that's never been baptized, having your sins washed away. The water's here. Well, that's a statement of faith. I haven't been back there. I don't, is there water here? Okay, okay. all right. There's water here. It's being confirmed. We're here to serve. We're here to help in any way. But once you think about that as we stand and sing.